right, well, hello and welcome to Grand Rapids Community College's best information security podcast, Defeasible Reasoning. I am joined here today in the Grand Rapids Community College Cybersecurity Study Studios in the Grand Rapids Community College Media Center by none other than not one, but as sort of an end of year treat to West Michigan information security professionals. I am joined by Ryan Plaz. Say hello to the nice people, Ryan. Hello. And by Elliot Herzl. Hello, everybody. And of course, as always, executive producer extraordinaire, Noah Desmite. Desmite. Hello. Desmitty. It's actually Desmit, but that's okay. Desmitty. <laughs> Desmitty. Right. Whatever you want to call it, that's cool, I, I guess. I said your name like a hundred times at this point. <laughs> I got it. I got it. All right. So t- uh, t- to further our introductions, Ryan here is a cybersecurity developer at Defense Point Security LLC. Is that correct? That is correct. And what what would you say a cybersecurity developer does say at Defense Point Security LLC? Um, this is supposed to be the easy question. I hope yeah. you can answer this one. I can tell you what I do. What would you say <laughs> you do here? Um, so broadly, what I do is develop security solutions, programming in general, our uh, security automation and orchestration platform. Uh, we're using splunk phantom and i help build custom apps and playbooks for that for the lay listener splunk is sort of the monitor your networky it's a it's a dump for your logs that lets you search them figure out what your computers were doing while you weren't looking at them and then go through and review it yep gotcha and then elliot i understand you are a systems engineer with priority advantage that is correct And so Um, what do you do exactly? So first off, there's a disclaimer. Um, I am speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of any of the companies that I currently work for or in the future will work for. Is is that (laughs) true of you also, Ryan? That is also true. Yeah, we we work with that assumption. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Feel free to get right up on that microphone, Elliot. All right. (laughs) So I currently do, um, I was onboarded to do kind of vendor onboarding uh, third-party assessment kinds of things. So there's a lot that happens with that. Slow down for a second. Unpack that for me. Vendor sure. onboarding means some other company. Yep. That we partner with for maybe like an application or partner with for a service to uh, per se provide ID cards to patients. So we have to work with them to transfer data or to transfer files or to ensure that we can use one of their applications to intermingle with the data. Um, So there's a lot that has to be connected there, and there's a lot that some people may not think about when they think, yeah, we're going to onboard a vendor. Well, okay, we have to outline the requirements. We have to outline really what they're supposed to be doing, what we can do, and where those lines sit. And there are many lines depending on what you're doing with them, whether you have to install some kind of service or server for them, or they might come on-prem, what kind of security do they have. And for the uninitiated, on-prem is on our premises. Yep. Like, they have to be in our yeah they would be local they might be contracted they might be um somebody that's offshore as well somebody that works in a different country there could be lots of fine lines there and i have to start to manage those aspects of our business which is priority advantage that is actually underneath um, what we call the mothership of spectrum health gotcha gotcha they all kind of merged into one big giant healthcare yes conglomerate and we do specifically Medicare Advantage plans. If if you are familiar with MAPD nope, and MAP, sure not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, um, it's insurance for the elderly folks. Mm-hmm. So we support them in making sure that things. We're kind of like a like a white label company that will create products for others. And you mean products, insurance products? Yes. You got into. IT or the cybers or whatever it is we do, you probably didn't set out to work in the insurance industry, right? Not entirely, uh, but I didn't really have any specific goal for, hey, I want to work for the government or in healthcare or in the banking industry. So if I can pivot off that question back to Ryan, are you guys sort of like a pure play IT shop or do you find that you wind up in like all these diverse industries, you know, at, you know, basically aggregating log files and and helping people sort through these things. 
So our company specifically, they're located out in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. I think they're located out there primarily because we do a lot of business with um, different government entities. That's where Uncle Sam lives. It is, right down the street. But we're not limited to working with government entities. We also do some commercial work also. Um, yeah. How did you each get started? Um, like, why computers, why security? So I'll go first. This is uh, Elliot. All right. <laughs> yep. So I started actually in IT right after um, my grocery store gig back at Big Top. I went over to ATEC from Big Top, and ATEC has showed me that um, customer service is probably like the number one key factor to doing business anywhere. Um, they have also shown me that it doesn't really matter too much what the workplace looks like. It matters what kind of work you can do. Because we were basically like the back end geek squad, but we would be fr do front end work and try to be salesmen for our products and still help customers out with um, PC tune ups, virus removal, um, custom computer builds. All that geek squad stuff? Yep. Heck yeah. Um, so this is where I started. This is where my beginning was. Um, as far as work, I got this job instead of another gentleman, which I actually wanted to be hired on too. He had a bachelor's degree in network security, and I got hired in without any kind of degree just based on what I learned from KCTC. So I knew things from KCTC that I applied to this job, and I moved up from here because I knew people in school. So I met a woman named Megan Peterman, and... Hopefully we're going to have her on the pod after she's no longer my student. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And she helped me get a job at Spectrum Health in the help desk, and from then I moved up and learned about all the different kinds of people that uh, do work in security. And I informed one of my bosses, one of my current boss, and had a meeting with him um, that, hey, I want to do security things. I want to be deep in the roots. And he let me free. And currently, I do vendor work, but I started doing very deeply technical security, working with Splunk, uh, working with other tools. Like um, currently, we're trying to onboard Exabeam. So What's an Exabeam? So that is a um, user behavioral analytics tool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the new hotness in security. So we're yeah. going to keep an eye on, not if you've got a virus on your computer, we're going to keep an eye on, is Bill logging in at 4 in the morning all of a sudden? Yep. <laughs> he never logs in at 4 in the morning. Yeah. He always has a second cup of coffee. At I don't know. House. Bill's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or if someday Bill's just exfiltrating gigabytes of data someday, that doesn't that's, seem right. That's normally not Bill's job. Exactly. And Ryan, you started... Um, Actually, at a place I, I kind of have a tangential connection to, okay. we used to do broadcast gear and like swap stuff with our friends at RBC, uh, the Radio Bible College, I believe uh, that's what that's correct, that yeah. Are. And you started making websites for those guys back I in the did. day? I um, did. So a little context before that, um, I went to good old Calvin College hoping to get a degree in computer science. Wonderful program over there, by the way. Big fan. Yeah. Uh, I had some issues personal issues with just being bad at college so that didn't work out um it took me 10 years to get an associate's degree yeah. so i can relate to being bad at college <laughs> i ended up coming here to grand rapids community college for a bit um oh thanks for plugging us unlike some other guests i could mention <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about you elliot <laughs> <All right. laughs> um actually came here to do audio engineering move over no yeah seriously <laughs> that last take the controls. That last, that's all it lasted about a semester but um i was trying to get an internship at rbc doing audio engineering so like, i want to see if i can actually like, you know do this that internship opportunity fell through but they're like hey we have a web development position open another internship you want to make websites for us yeah i was like okay yeah um i was a webmaster in middle school so you know <laughs> i remember how i remember how myspace works yeah i got yeah, this sure um so yeah, let me do that. Uh, was in the internship for about nine months, I think. And then they hired me afterwards. And I was like, well, I guess I don't have to go back to school now. How'd you uh, transition from developer to security focused developer? So mostly I just found the right company. A lot of security companies are you know, potentially lacking development talent. They'll, they'll have security people that also know kind of how to develop things. And then they were looking more for someone that was a developer that could learn security things. So I had the necessary skills and the desire to learn. So got the job. Gotcha. So it was, we get, we hear a lot of that where we, we don't really have 
any humans who were classically trained as security folks because security just wasn't a thing about 45 minutes ago. Right. So now we've got to take people who either know systems or take people on networks or take people in those coding and grow them into what have yous. So now you and I know one another from hashtag MySec, hashtag GRSec, which is, how did that happen? So I was... I started at Defense Point. Um, I was looking to you know, get more involved in the information security field. Um, so I started looking for meetups to go to. There's a couple in Grand Rapids, but they either meet like quarterly or you know it's more management focused, something like that. But then I found MySec. What's their website, mysec.us? US. Yep. What kind of stuff do you do there? Um, so so each, each meetup has a specific day. So Grand Rapids is Thursday. Um, the second Thursday is the meeting. The last Thursday is a social. So that's just going to the bar and hanging out. Cool. Talking, getting to know one another. That's yeah. cool. And like working, anybody can come. Yep. Open to everybody. Um, it's a pretty casual atmosphere. Where um, where are the meetings going to be held? The meetings are going to be held at Grand Rapids Community College. Really? The Applied Technology Center. Oh, the ATC, you say? Yeah. I think uh, currently scheduled in the Maker's Lab, too. Correct. And so, like, there was a little brand confusion going on about GRSec because when I was a young man, there were all these guys who worked at Spectrum Health who now work at Target. <laughs> and <laughs> they used to have, and amongst others, amongst others, there's a, um, a handful of dudes who would, who would occasionally show up to this thing called GRSec, which is grsec.blogspot.com. And th when those fellas and... I think it was only fellas moved off to um, the beautiful Twin Cities area. Um, it sort of died on the vine, but then occasionally got together. And I think where we're headed with this is that we're going to try and can bring those two things together and get the the nice guys from the old GR sec to come hang out with us at uh, at the new GR sec. Get some old blood in. So, like to to tell you how old school this was when I got my CISSP, oh which is super cool. <laughs> meant I immediately got a high paying job in information security. The, um, you needed somebody to jump you in. And uh, do you know Stephen Tobias over yes, there? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. So he and I knew each other from back in the karate days. Wow. Yep. And I was like, man, if I'm going to have somebody jump me into the CISSP gang, Toby Wan needs okay. to be the guy to get it done. <laughs> karate days? Oh, yeah, dude. Okay. Way back in the day. So <laughs> actually, the, my first teaching experience, I try not to to do my biography too much in this deal but so just fast forward i uh i ran a karate school for a couple of years it's, oh i thought you just took you like you ran a whole school yeah dude oh, wow dang yeah. so my um my instructor moved to a bigger building on 20th street and there was this little rundown karate shack which was on Cal Burton before you get to Kalamazoo where the train tracks are on Burton Street mm -hmm. and it was called Blue Dragon Martial Arts and it always kind of had a soft spot in my heart because I grew up on the southeast side and like the reason I learned karate is because I got my ass kicked on those train tracks by a couple of dudes <laughs> wow. one day oh and I came home just whooped on and my mom was like you need to learn karate so, wow. so wow. you became like Mr. Miyagi uh, I, you know, I, that was kind of like a career goal. Yeah. I think I'm Miyagi in a different way than the, okay. the, the straight up martial arts thing. And then like, I, I had this whole crisis of conscience when you do kind of look like Miyagi though. I do. <laughs> I had this sort of crisis of conscience when mar mixed martial arts became a thing. And I watched, um, one of the Gracie's climb up this six foot eight, uh, black belt Dutchman and just choke him right the heck out. Wow. And you know, he's like four foot two and I'm like, Jeez. I think I'm missing a component in this whole martial arts <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah that like yeah i i have a sensei complex because of that i think so it, my understanding is that the my sec grew out of b-sides detroit yes is that right yep okay and they were kind of like the uh, cheering squad for that um so and, and, and gr sec i think was a paul melson invention if i'm not mistaken um d just trying to build community here which which is also part of the squad that makes gurkhan happen and i think paul's still involved with that but mostly it's a chris Payne yeah. joint these days elliot you didn't yeah. explain to me how grand Rapids community college influenced your journey in information <laughs> security other than you met megan and she hooked you up with a gig yeah um so it's influenced me in a way to help me grow and learn um, and to become a better individual not just personally but as well as like learning all the different technical aspects whether it be in linux slash unix networking which i apparently excelled at 
and ethical hacking was one of my favorite classes which uh, our professor here taught me and it was probably one of the best classes that i've ever had wow you yeah. can't get a better grade at this point so there's yeah. no use in sucking <laughs> <laughs> no that's all right i i enjoyed that um something that i i kind of learned from that is the there's kind of a gray line between red and blue team in some aspects uh, but I personally still prefer being on the blue team rather than the red because I'd rather help harden the infrastructure, help secure things. Um, testing is also nice. I don't know what your, your thoughts are, what everybody else's thoughts are, but um, I prefer the blue team. Well, Ryan, it sounds like you're stuck on the blue team if yep. you're analyzing log files. Yeah, yeah, that's fine with me. What does that mean, blue team? So, well, I know red versus, red versus blue. I kind yeah. of understand that concept, but what's like, I didn't know that blue team actually had like some... Uh, deeper meaning yeah i I, I, did, I didn't learn this very long ago either so, don't feel so bad. blue team is much more like the the guys that are that you go to for help in your organization um, they may be guys on the back end that help control like the security operations center they're the guys that help maintain your business honestly because that's what it all comes down to we all use computers to do business and computers have to be secured so they're normally the guys that will help implement solutions and help people um, to better secure themselves, the business, the data, um, all the different aspects that you use in a day, um, whether it be, hey, you're logging into our online banking system. You have to use two-factor auth now because that's more secure. Um, small things like that. And there's a lot that goes into Two-factor authentication being you know, a password plus. I do know what that is. Okay, just trying to make sure we're keeping you up <laughs> no, to that's speed. All right. And what about red team? What's red that? team is much more like offensive testing. Mm. It should be something, in my belief, that helps you harden your infrastructure, helps you secure what you have going already. So if I were to attempt to attack something that you have, I should work with you to ensure that that's more secure. So if you go back run. to maybe yeah two podcasts ago remember jim yes the closest job he's ever had to being a spy right. straight up red team <laughs> so like it, and we we steal that language from the military who used to have red team activities where they would have a you know somebody try and break into the base and those guys would be the red team and then the yeah. blue team would be defending the base because, right well, well i also always think of that classic um red versus blue red versus yeah. blue series online series i don't know is With that halo? like yeah, with Halo. Is that yeah. kind of like an old person thing now, though, that series? Or is it still relevant to the young folks? It's still relevant here. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. you get the raffle cosper and it goes swah, 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 swah. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Yes. Um, but um, red and blue team, and it can be more than just computer security. It can be like lock picking. So if you have no locks on certain things, then that's that's probably a bad idea like especially your data center you need to have many controls in place and then maybe you want to bring in a red teamer that has a specific role of picking those locks to see how quick mm. and easy he can get in you can't just roll for dexterity and see see what happens no <laughs> no i know that's what they do i mean think about it but that's why um like dr demott's place that uh, jim works at they they employ ex-military dudes who you know not bad at picking locks you know so that physical security component of it so you're into the automation piece and orchestration what does that allow my business to do that that like elliot can't do all by his lonesome sure i think the biggest thing it allows you to do is maybe if you say you're running a sock um a security operations yeah, center if yeah, you will no uh <laughs> the thing you put on your foot um <laughs> i run in socks <laughs> not exclusively obviously could you, but. could you run a sock in socks just socks if you did it right while getting socked <laughs> in a karate perhaps uh, okay right. we have, we digress All so right. you're running a sock yep um you know it allows you to run a you know potentially a, a leaner sock so less people um it kind of i don't want to say it replaces tier one but it it empowers tier one analysts uh, the immediate benefits you're going to see from um, you know, automating uh, security response is, um, you know, an, an incident happens, you get the logs, you see like some I, IP addresses, some domains, some things happening. You're going to copy those, paste them into VirusTotal, paste them into and other do services. Do an MD5 hash of all yeah. the binaries that came across the wire. Yeah. So to, to 
put that into normal people talk, <laughs> an incident happens, which is like Bill clicked on the link in an email. Yep. And we uh -oh. don't like it when Bill does that. God, Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> And we'd love to get rid of him, but he's the only one who knows anything about some kind of insurance business. He also brings donuts on Friday. That's what I feel like, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, and something triggers um, an alarm and feeds it into a computer system, like some kind of incident sim security incident management tool thing. And you're the product that, um, what are they calling it? Phantom? Phantom, yeah. Phantom sees that happens. And then using these playbooks of yep. what you speak does some things. And then Correct. like, what's that process? So incident comes in, there's a bunch of what they would call artifacts attached to it. So IP addresses, domains, MD5 hashes, any, any details about the incident that are important. Sweet, sweet PCAPs full oh, of packets. Yeah. Whatever you want. All right. Um, what Phantom will do, well, it knows what kind of incident that is. You write a playbook to at least begin responding to that so um deleting bill, bob's account bob was bob or bill it, bob they're probably bill, both bill. guilty <laughs> <laughs> um, so it immediately deletes his password yeah. and his user account and sends him a you've been terminated letter correct wow <laughs> that's extreme so uh, we'll say it's like a phishing email or something <laughs> um what you would do is write a a playbook to begin responding to that so Normally, you'd begin investigating those artifacts manually. Um, but what Phantom allows you to do is create a playbook that says, like, oh, I want to hit virus total. I want to um, do like a who is on this. I want to geolocate it. I want to do all these things. I can do them. To make sure your opponent knows that you know they're there. Yeah. Right. By like hitting their <laughs> DNS servers. Sure. And Why not? Perfect. Um, <laughs> hey, that's, not, that's not my part. You tell me what to do. I put it in a playbook. <laughs> and it happens. <laughs> and it happens. What that allows to happen is incident comes in and before an analyst even has a chance to look at it, all of that stuff's already run and is in there for them to see when they actually get to, you know, checking it out. As a guy who, uh, in his previous gig was into automating people out of employment, the way I think we used to say this is that what we do is we enable the employees we have to do more, Correct. to move into different yep. positions. So what, um, I'm hearing is that basically there's a there's a rote set of procedures that I'm gonna do when an incident happens. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the user's machine. I'm gonna review all the log files, and, and a playbook allows that all that stuff that normally is just rote repetitive work to kick off. Correct. And then we free up the analyst to do like the human creative Correct. thinking side of that. Like, Make a decision. Yeah. Do we want to delete B Smith at company dot com yep. from our Active Directory now and send him termination papers? Because that's the kind of power that information security departments have in the real world. Yeah, and okay. the potential there too. Oh wait, is no, that no, they don't. You yeah. can, you can, you can get to the point of, um, depending on your confidence level, um, automating the response to an incident also. But so if you if you had logs that said something like Bob downloaded a file and started running it, maybe the appropriate incident response would be something like we kick his computer off of the network until Quarantine we can machine, dispatch yeah. somebody to take a look at it. Correct. Bet you wish you had a system that did that. <laughs> well, being in the cloud, it's slightly different, but we we have certain controls in place. What is uh so? What is the cloud element of what it is you do? So the cloud element, I actually do a bit of security beyond just vendor kinds of things, third party assessment kinds of things. I work with our network folks actually back at Spectrum as well as some of the security folks to actually make sure we can harden ourselves and ensure that the cloud is more secure. Now, it's kind of like a new platform for most people. A lot of people have on-prem security solutions, but moving into the cloud, um, things are nice like AWS, Azure Office 365, but there's a lot more that you still have to manage as far as like access, who has access to what what things are intertwined with each other, how things are tagged in AWS. So it's kind of just a plat a different platform. You don't really have to manage the lower layers being on-prem or like the HVAC of your server room. I don't have like to worry that. if like the wires are broken or anything like no. that. <laughs> That's all taken care of by your cloud service provider. Does this involve a CASB? So and what is a CASB? You didn't know there'd be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting point. So 
that is something that I don't know if I want to discuss currently because there are certain things that we're implementing that um, do help that those kinds of things. You don't want to, but you're going to. Yeah, no. yeah. I'm just kidding. We're, we're not trying to put you on. Uh, for the kids at home, though, um, what's a Casby? A cloud services access broker or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they provide like the maybe not federated services, but something similar to that concept. So like one login for my users and they can get onto all the things all the time. Yeah. That, so that works great everywhere I've ever been. Well, it is a unified system. Whether it's the most secure or not is debatable, especially like the transmission of, oh, if you log into this one service, then that one service also logs you in. How does that work? You don't have to enter your password twice. Some people call it OAuth. Some people use SAML or SSO. I, I could explain them if you want. I, I definitely got that they were acronyms. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, but there are different federated services. Amazon is, does a really nice job of um, putting in Azure. I think they also work with Google Cloud as well for logins. All right. So, yes. One of the last okay. consulting gigs I did was was trying to unwrap the rat's nest of somebody's like home brewed central authentication system. And I was just like, you guys just need to walk away. We use Find a lot of... <laughs> We happen to use um, a lot of the base things, but customize them for ourselves. So we don't have any weird scripts or anything that run that are inefficient. We use a lot of their services, but build on top of them to make them more secure. Gotcha. And as long as we're getting information about your network, what's the minimum password? So <laughs> <laughs> at least 54 characters, um, special lowercase number. You have to have something from a different language, specifically like um, Swahili, UTF-9. No. <laughs> I, as a video producer and audio producer, use the Adobe suite a lot. And for a few years now, it's uh, all been in the cloud. Um, that's yes. how you subscribe. It automatically updates. Um, and you're talking about, you know, Office 365, which mm -hmm. um, is, is in the cloud. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the cloud as well. Do you guys see software and security services just more and more moving to the cloud in that way so that you're really not doing any kind of local installing it's all just sort of connect to the internet and get it done yeah oh uh, okay uh, yeah good <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i think one of the benefits you get from moving things to the cloud is um let me throw out a buzzword here scalability so um using something like aws or Azure and things allow you to easily um, scale up your system. So add more servers, add more memory, add whatever. Like you distribute need. more software. Yeah, distribute okay. more, I guess. And it also moves the management of that more to someone else. I mean, you, you still configure it yourself, but it's not a physical machine in your building that you are managing. Right. If you remember back to our friend Jim. Mm -hmm. unpronounceable last name that starts with s skyler, skyler <laughs> which it doesn't look like um he their business is doing that and and he would say that the one caveat to that is the cloud thing only really works for things like salesforce.com office 365 adobe's software distribution platform but not software access platform um, because they were built cloud first and his takeaway from a lot of businesses who just hear the cloud scalability buzzword extravaganza, you know, some C level executive hears that and says, oh, we need to do that. And then they take their stuff and they put it into the cloud. And since it wasn't designed with that minimalistic philosophy of, you know, nowadays there are serverless applications, there are applications that um, basically just talk to other interfaces and we don't even know what's going on below that. But if you've got some old, system that was designed to run on a server and use all the cpu cycles oftentimes he finds that people move into the cloud discover that all of their old crap is too expensive in the cloud because it's not designed to work that way and then they wind up pulling people back out mm. onto like a either back into their data center or back into a data center hosted by someone where you buy the equipment as opposed to the cloud so so it sounds all super easy and and fun to do but there have been a bunch of people who've tried it out and then find out, oh. It's just a different set of problems. Yeah. And a, a set of problems that are are an expense, a cap, they're a capex as opposed to a 
they're not a capital expense. They're a, they're an ongoing operation. They're OPEX. They're an operational expense. So like that affects how your taxes work and how you can, you know, capital expenses you can depreciate. So there's like all these business implications that go along with it, particularly hmm. for smaller businesses, which is hashtag nightmare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have, speaking of the most interesting thing I've seen in the cloud lately, has anybody seen Project Stream from Google where they take a Chrome browser and stream Assassin's Creed to you on it? Mm. How's that work for bandwidth? What that's is that? The, What's the cost there? That's the thing. It, it, it takes some bandwidth to get it done. Yeah. I have a friend who has tried it and says it's, it's a video game. And the latency isn't an issue, and on a cable modem it looks fine. But so all that money we're spending on insourcing our video cards, um, Google's going to break that, and they're just going to move all that stuff to the cloud. Well, it still has to render on the system. Nope. It renders just in the browser. It renders in the cloud and then is transmitted to your system. An interesting experience related to this that I have, uh, um, I've been trying to play Portal 2 with my daughter. And um, man, I love that game. It's such a good game. Good yeah. stuff, Maynard. And playing it with my kid has been a, like an amazing experience. But some NVIDIA update broke my gaming computer's ability to play it. And I think it might have something to do with their their recording software or something. But long story short, you'd push the button to start Steam and it'd break. So what I wound up doing is streaming it off of a laptop from the laptop to my big computer just because uh -huh. it's got the big monitor and stuff. Mm -hmm. It works fine. You know, oh, so wow. just you just extend that yeah. across your cable modem, and it's the same idea. So, how do we get a hold of you guys on the social medias? Are you into that sort of thing? Do you have a personal brand that you're attempting to extend through the use of social medias, or do you just post pictures of puppies and stuff? I just don't use it that much, but I have it. I am at WordPress on Twitter. Back when you were doing WordPress, it was an attempt to brand myself as a WordPress developer. You know, at this See what point, you did there. I'm too I'm too into it to switch. So. You get a lot of people in this business who have like decisions they made when they were 13 haunting them for the rest of their days. Wow, that sounds personal. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, my friend, it was my friend. Uh, asking for a friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> what about you, Elia? How do we get a hold of you? So normally I am on the LinkedIn's. I do not currently have a Twitter. I know a lot of cybersecurity professionals use Twitter for lots of things. Um, so I'm also on uh, GitHub as well as I'm trying to make my own blog. Uh, it's Sinter, S-Y-N-T-U-R-E dot com. And that's also the same handle on my GitHub. What's a Sinter? That is a something that is generated from a word generator. But I saw it and I, I thought of TCP IP. Oh, so go. if you're familiar with like the how you establish a connection to another thing on the internet. The whole three-way handshake business. Yeah, Did the, you know there's a four-way? Shake. Yes. It's yes. Amazing. <laughs> so sin, sin, ack, and ack. So it's S Y N S Y N dash T U R E dot com. And it is very blank. So feel free to judge all you want currently. <laughs> I like the key logo. That's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I, I enjoy cracking the Wi Fi's in my own realm of your own Wi Fi's, not other people's. Yes. Wifi's. All right. Yeah. You can come in and break the pineapple if you want in the hacking lab if you're I will. looking for something to break into. Okay. All right. Well, so one thing we haven't done that we have been remiss about is to thank not only our guests, thank you, gentlemen, we appreciate you coming on board, and our executive producer, but you, friends on the internet, the listener, I understand we have, we have soared into the double digits <laughs> of downloads and subscribes, so thank you very much. I, as always, am Professor Andrew Rosema, and this was Defeasible Reasoning. Feasible Reasoning is produced at the Epic Studios of Grand Rapids Community College Media Technologies Department. Epically executive produced by Noah D. Smith and hosted by me, Drew Rosen. 